Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail Critics, and of course, my Underwater Train Finders. You are the reason why this content remains full of unspeakable crippling depression. And today, we are going to discuss a really, really sad story if you're a fan of locomotives at all, especially steam locomotives. It's pretty common knowledge that the vast majority of historical steam locomotives at the end of the steam age wound up scrapped, with only a handful surviving that process into preservation. I did do a top five list talking about locomotives that were preserved yet wound up scrapped anyway in one way or the other. That does occasionally occur. Sometimes it's for a good reason and sometimes it's not. And I stumbled upon another one, but this is a bit of a long story. Something I really felt like I couldn't do justice on a top five list. Everything on those lists has to be streamlined because, duh, I have to talk about five different things. But this engine deserves her own video as she was scrapped as late as 1987. This is the sad story of Grand Trunk Western 5629. The 5629 was a 462 Pacific locomotive, known as a K4A, built by Alco in 1924 for the Grand Trunk Western Railroad. The K4As are actually copies of the USRA Light Pacific locomotives, and they were actually extremely good, capable of 80 miles per hour top speed, with good tractive effort, power output. For their era, they were excellent and 5629 served faithfully for many years. She was the third member of the K4As, initially designed for commuter service, though later in life she would be assigned to freight duties. In the 50s, like pretty much every American railway, GTW dieselized their locomotive fleet, and that put many, many steam locomotives on the chopping block, but 5629 wound up spared from that, mostly due to luck and coincidence. Right before she was scheduled to be retired and sold for scrapped, she became one of a handful of locomotives on the GTW to be used to pull fan trips that were sponsored by the Michigan Railroad Club. She pulled one on September 27, 1959 that ran between Detroit and Bay City, Michigan. Right about that point, a man by the name of Richard Jensen, who was a rail fan from the Chicago area, was looking for a steam locomotive to purchase as he wanted to operate his own steam-powered excursion trains. Which is a dream I think every rail fan has, let's be honest. We all want our own railway around here. Don't lie. You know you do. He was aboard the fan trip that 5629 had pulled, and he was very impressed with the locomotive, thinking that she'd be a perfect candidate given her pulling power and high speed. And in March of 1960, he was able to purchase 5629 for her scrap value of $9,540.40. From there, she was moved, on her own wheels, to a sideline that was rented by Jensen at the Baltimore and Ohio Yard in Hammond, Indiana, so she could undergo a rebuilding process. Jensen himself put in the physical labor to accomplish this, with the assistance of Illinois Central Roundhouse foreman, Irv Coffrin. The men worked 50 hours a week, getting her ready to run again, and Jensen had to drive a two-hour round trip every day he worked on her. He was dedicated at the time, trying his best to get 5629 up and running, losing sleep. One night while working underneath her, he fell asleep right there. He didn't wake up again till 3.30 a.m. and returned home for just three more hours of sleep in his own bed. But the work paid off. In early October 1961, 5629 was fired again under private ownership for the first time. And after a few test runs, she was ready to pull her first excursion train, which was scheduled for October 22nd, though it was delayed, and it actually took place on November 5th. It was a complete tour of the Baltimore and Ohio Chicago Terminal Railroad. The first run was a complete success. 5629 performed admirably, and people were excited to have another working steam locomotive on the rails again. She would pull additional excursion trains on the same lines for the Railroad Club of Chicago's Iron Horse Excursions program. Jensen had acquired many, many, many spare parts from scrap dealers just to use them on 5629, 
and a few of those actually altered her appearance that made her look a lot closer to the USRA Light Pacifics that her type had been based on. For the time being, she was allowed to stay at the B&O Roundhouse, though Jensen was in the process of looking for a new location to store her. In 1964, he would become close friends with the president of the Chicago and Western Indiana Railroad, Robert McMillan. McMillan agreed to allow Jensen to store his equipment in a portion of his railroad's roundhouse on 49th Street in Chicago, which is great for Jensen because that's a lot closer to where he lived. Jensen then founded a group called the Midwest Steam Rail Fans Association, MSRA, which was dedicated to operate and maintain 5629 and other locomotives he owned. Other locomotives that other people owned, but he was associated with repairing, were also included in that. Once she was moved, 5629 went through some repairs and prepped to haul some long-distance excursion trains on mainline trackage that was owned by the GTW, the former Nickel Plate Railroad, and Wabash trackage that was recently acquired by the Norfolk and Western Railway. She was also refitted with a six-axle tender in order to increase her fuel and water capacity. The first scheduled long-distance trips took place in May of 1966. She traveled to Indianapolis to celebrate the sesquicentennial of the state of Indiana, and she pulled a series of excursion trains between Indianapolis and Noblesville. During one of the excursions, her water injector malfunctioned, and the NNW ordered the crews to drop her fire after stopping on the main line as a safety precaution. Which, yeah, we've been over how bad that can go. Two diesel locomotives pulled the excursion in Noblesville, and 5629 was towed back to Indianapolis. Jensen drove back to Chicago to grab some tools and spare parts to repair her by the following day. There was talk of using her for a new tourist railroad, but the project was cancelled due to lack of funds, so she was moved back to Chicago. 5629 saw continued success into 1968, and that didn't go unnoticed by Southern Railway's president, W. Graham Clater Jr., or the Southern Steam Program leader, Bill Purd. They arranged a business meeting with Jensen in Chicago with the hopes of purchasing 5629 for use to pull their own excursion trains within the southeastern United States. They would also cosmetically alter her to look like a Southern Railway's PS4 class. Jensen himself arrived at the meeting extremely late, and he was covered in soot and grease from working on number 5629. Clater and Purd still made a huge offer to purchase the locomotive, but Jensen said no, as he believed she was worth a rather ridiculous price, apparently. At this point, it's abundantly clear that Jensen is a little eccentric, but he clearly cares a great deal about what he's working on. But the thing about that is, it wouldn't always be like this. Jensen is a complicated figure. Some people defend him, saying he was great and saved the locomotive and it'll all be this evil railway's fault that we'll get to in a second. But the truth of the matter is, Jensen did a lot of things wrong. Now, I'm not saying he should have sold her to Southern Railway, but I think if he had, she might still be around. Jensen planned to use 5629 to pull another excursion train on April 25th, 1971, over Penn Central trackage between Chicago and Logansport. But that wound up being cancelled due to insurance issues with the Rock Island Railroad, over getting passenger cars for the trip. And to be fair, Penn Central tracks in 1971? No, I, I wouldn't want to ride on them either. Ticket buyers wanted refunds, and because Jensen had paid for some passenger cars to be moved to Chicago, which never came, as well as also going through a legal battle with the new owners of the CNWI, he was left with a heavy financial deficit. Around the same time, several other steam excursion trips that were being held around the Chicago area were causing a decline of ridership on Jensen's run. 5629 was unique, certainly, but there were other steam locomotives, and not everyone had enough money to pay to ride on all of them. Those kind of trips, for many people, are kind of a once-a-year thing. You pick one, you ride one. You pick another, you ride another. But it's once per year. 5629 wasn't special anymore in terms of being a steam locomotive in that area. Jensen wound up losing interest in hosting fan trips entirely, and the last train that 5629 would ever pull was in the spring of 1973. After that, she was stored in Penn Central's yard outside of Chicago's Union Station. This is where things take a steep downslope for 5629. Like I said, she would wind up being scrapped, but the process to get there has to do with a lot of mismanagement and legal issues, on Jensen's part, 
as well as Metra's, Chicago's commuter railroad. In 1977, Jensen broke his back from slipping and falling while he was helping a friend move a refrigerator. The medical bills crippled the finances that Jensen still had left, and he couldn't afford to pay rent to store any of his equipment. As a result, he had to approach several railroads in Chicago for permission to store 5629 on their property. And he finally reached an agreement with Rock Island. They would allow him to store the locomotive in their deteriorating roundhouse in Blue Island, Illinois. But later, in 1979, the Blue Island Roundhouse was scheduled to be demolished, and 5629 had to be moved again towards the middle of the Rock Island's Blue Island freight yard. Rock Island is an interesting story on its own, and maybe I'll make a video about that sometime. But they declared bankruptcy in 1980. When that happened, Metra acquired the Blue Island Yards, and they were planning to construct a new shop complex there. Due to the issues of legality here, Metra was allowed to use the yard, since it was theirs now, but they weren't allowed to move 5629 because she was owned by Jensen. That wasn't included in the bankruptcy or any of the transition of property because, well, Rock Island had never technically owned her. They were just letting Jensen keep her there. Now, a lot of versions of the story paint Metra as this horrible, evil organization that completely screwed over Mr. Jensen and 5629, but that's not strictly true. At first, they ordered Jensen to move 5629 150 yards to the nearby Iowa Interstate Railroad. Though, they wouldn't provide him any assistance in actually doing that, and since 5629 hadn't actually moved under her own power in a while, that really wasn't reasonable. They also told him that they refused to allow an inspection of the locomotive that would let someone else be willing to move it for Jensen. So, really, they weren't being reasonable in this instance. Jensen did inspect and prepped her to be moved, but he discovered that 5629 had been vandalized during her time stored in Blue Island. She was stripped of critical moving parts, including the bearings of the wheels, and she was landlocked with bits of trackage in front of her removed. How was he supposed to move it now? The, the track's not even there. Metra. Metra. Let's be fair about this. Okay. He can't move it without the track. That's not going to happen. The man broke his back. Can you lift a locomotive? Because I can't. And I've never broken my back. I'm just saying. However, this is when Jensen went to a bit of a more, uh, well, less sympathetic perspective. There's a lot he could have done at this point. Appeal to Metra, ask someone to help him, do anything, really. But he didn't try, because he was dealing with his financial problems at the time. Jensen began to plan, and he felt that if he didn't do anything to move 5629, that would force Metra to scrap her. And then, he could file a lawsuit against Metra, and win enough money to fix his issues. This, of course, would involve the loss of 5629, but Jensen was trying to fix his own problems. However, that wouldn't go off as smoothly as he thought, because Jensen probably felt like Metra just didn't care about 5629, and that's not entirely true. Over the following years, Metra repeatedly incessantly tried to work with Jensen in getting the locomotive repaired and possibly moved, or at least moved in a less inconvenient spot. Something. Anything. And they were willing to charge him rental fees just like the other railroads had for storing her. But he never paid them. Jensen also went out of his way to further remove additional critical components from her throughout 1985 and 1986, and most of those he sold to local rail fans. By the end of 1986, Metra got fed up. It's true, they had started things out pretty roughly by having unreasonable expectations, but now Jensen wasn't trying. Jensen was being the difficult one. And I left them with a little option but to go to court. And the court ruled that if 5629 wasn't removed from Metra's property, she would have to be destroyed. Other people scrambled to try to assist in the situation, to help save 5629, several groups made attempts to purchase her without Jensen's approval. But the problem there is that they needed Jensen's approval. Metra didn't own the locomotive. They couldn't sell her. Jensen had to. The Illinois Railroad Museum even offered to purchase her for $15,000 from Jensen. They made the offer to him. And he said no! What? Are you serious? Come on! The Mid-Continent Railroad Museum made a similar offer, which was again refused. Jensen was bent on making sure that he could sue Metra. 
He wasn't interested in saving 5629 anymore. He was interested in getting as much money out of a lawsuit as possible. Metro tried to remedy the situation by petitioning the court to allow them to assume ownership of the locomotive so they could just donate it to a museum because they really, really, really did not want to scrap this thing. But the court said no. Because with the situation as it was, legally, they weren't allowed to claim ownership of Jensen's property. Even though Jensen, for all intents and purposes, had basically abandoned it. And it all finally came to a head on July 1st, 1987. Metra received a court order that they were to scrap 5629 on site. Jensen, despite the fact that he was the only reason that 5629 was in this situation, appealed the order. Perhaps in an attempt to save face, though it's unknown exactly why. The court declined the appeal nine days after that, and Metra contacted the Ehrman Howell Division of the Luria Brothers Scrap Company to dispose of 5629 right where she stood. The scrapping process began on July 14th, and it was done by July 20th. 5629 was gone. Once that happened, Jensen, of course, seized his opportunity and filed a lawsuit against Metra, requesting compensation for the loss of his locomotive. But in one bright spot of karmic retribution, the court told him to shove it. No additional gains were given to him as a result of his rather poorly conceived plan to fix his financial troubles. The only thing he succeeded in doing is destroying the piece of steam heritage equipment that he had helped save. Metra also subsequently discovered that much of the vandalism that had been done to her had been done by their own employees, many of whom were fired between 1988 and 1989. Jensen himself would pass away due to poor health on March 16, 1991. 5629 is nothing more than a sad memory. The notion that a preserved steam locomotive could be destroyed as she was as late as 1987 is enough to turn the stomach of any rail fan. But in another bright spot, one of her sisters, GTW number 5632, a K4B, is still around on static display in Duran, Michigan. The only difference between the K4As and the Bs is that the Bs had an all-weather cab. It's just sad to say that 5632 will never be able to see her sister again. And with that, a special thank you goes out to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward. Some do 267, Orange Glass, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoth 444, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsu 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Master of None, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, DM Tribal Typhoon, Tommy Rossini, Ohio Trucker 1, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Joshua Long, Alaric Jaspers, Brian Pretzer, Twin Fox, Jack Carson's Railroad Videos, Major Klutz, and Ty Hammonds Jr. Till next time, this is Darkness, individual of Fawn, farewell.